Lacey Powers. Um, I work at this little startup called Moonshadow Mobile, and we do mobile canvassing and data analytics and geospatial things. And um, I'm here to talk to you about how uh, we use PostgreSQL with mobile canvassing. Um, so just the basics of canvassing. Canvassing is all about targeting a population. You want to narrow down to like your supporters or people who are actually interested in your product if you're not doing something political. Um, and you know, and sometimes people do it for community outreach and things like that. So basically you want to narrow it to a population of people that want to and, and might be interested in your message. Most of the time it's used for things like get out the vote and everything, um, but the main point of it is the targeting and you also need to guarantee your completeness. You need to make sure that you've, you've tried to um, contact as many of those targeted people as you possibly can. So lots of us walk around with um, this really sophisticated tiny little computer in our pocket. Um, and it's got all sorts of radio connections. Um, it's also, most of them have GPS chips now. Um, and so you have radio connections with Wi-Fi and with um, mobile data and just with the cell tower and things like Android and iOS use that to pinpoint, to pinpoint you and everything. So you can, you can know someone's location very closely um, uh, in an area and see how they move and everything. Um, you can also write custom programs for them. Um, the big point of this is, is you can really leverage this technology for lots of awesome, efficient canvassing. So to be able to reach the appropriate population, you need to do really good analysis. They need to have really detailed analysis. And um, People mix together political data, like your voting history, your registered party, how many times you vote, um, uh, donation history, things like that. Um, demographic data, like how old are you, what's your race, what's your gender, things like that. Psychographic data, which you can get from like commercial sources and things like that, where it's, um, you mentioned things like, okay, well, you, subscribe to outdoor magazines or you subscribe to religious magazines or personal or, or, or like pet things or whatever. Um, sorry. Um, and then people have custom data that they want to put in because sometimes even though we have a really rich data source, there's stuff that people don't want to cover. Like there were some people in a state that wanted to, uh, to target people who own trucks, had guns and, um, love dogs. Um, and really useful data platforms need to allow for stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of an overview of our platform and everything. Um, and there's kind of two data parts to it. Um, there's this, we have this network file server. Um, and that holds um, what we all refer to as, as static data. It's, we take large amounts of data and we compress it very, very, very small into this binary format, and it goes into this thing that we call a query server, which is actually our lead programmer's, um, I think it was his PhD thesis, actually. I'm not sure if he ever finished his PhD thesis, but um, yeah, they had that before it came along, and then, then there's uh, Postgres, which holds dynamic data, which is um, data that's generated by people doing analysis on the query server here. And um, you know it's saved for future reference and everything. It also holds like uh, like customer data, like their usernames and what applications they're allowed and everything like that. And it talks to the authentication server. Um, so there's the analysis part, which is basically this. It connects out to the network, and then there's a web client that runs. And I'll show you, you examples of this. Um, and then there's also the API, which um, uses a bunch of other, other sorts of technologies, like we have this um, web app because people really, really wanted to be able to do um, phone canvassing, and they just wanted to be able to pull something up on a page. And then there's the mobile device stuff that I talked about earlier, and you know, just a way for people to export out stuff um, in various formats if they want to, which is 
the report server part. Um, so this is kind of what the analysis platform looks like. This is a, one of our, this is like our biggest app actually. Um, and uh, the query server generates these tiles. It also generates these statistics over here. Um, but this, like the sidebar, how this is laid out here um, is stored in Postgres, whether or not these things are enabled, also stored there, um, how this is displayed, what map you use, all sorts of different things. Um, and this is just basically a representation of all the population of the United States, because most of our customers use that. Um, but for the most part, customers are interested in um, uh, canvassing on a much smaller level. Most of them work within states. And this is, this is Oregon. Um, and here's an example of a quick little thing that I threw together for this talk of a survey of whether or not you like cats or dogs. And everything. And I'll go over in more detail what this means and why it's important and everything. But how does Postgres help with all of this? Um, Postgres is actually a really, really powerful platform for cleaning and transforming data. Because um, data's dirty, clients have all sorts of ideas of what's, what's cool and what isn't, and what's OK in their system isn't necessarily OK in ours because, well, the query server's kind of cranky. Um, it also gives us durable, dependable, flexible data storage. Like we can use things like ByDay and JSON and all sorts of other things. And we also use it to um, offload features from developers because they're really busy. Um, not that I'm not really busy or everything, but um, <laughs> yeah, everybody's really busy. So if we can offload things to Postgres and we can centralize various bits, that's always a win, especially in a little startup. So customers have data in a lot of different formats. Um, the most common are these fixed width, CSV, and shape files. Um, fixed width files are basically, um, you have a line of t continuous text and you need to know what the offsets are and um, the number of characters for each one. Um, CSV is basically any sort of delimited file. And then shape files are this particular geospatial format um, that's got like an XML file and binary and a bunch of other stuff. But the common thing that all these have is most of the time they're really dirty. They're really like people um, format things weird or they'll have columns off or they just won't include something or whatever. And it of often requires tons of cleansing, manipulating, and validation, all of which Postgres actually does really well. Um, there's also this large ecosystem of tools that are totally awesome that we've used in different places. A uh, PG loader um, is really good for fixed width files. You can just make a definition, a load definition, and a table schema, and then just throw it at it. This is really, really handy for things like the census data, the United States census data. Um, a lot of it is in fixed width format, and um, it's, it's miserable to deal with, but PG loader makes it really nice. Um, we leverage a lot of PostGIS because we use a lot of shapefiles. Um, shapefiles define areas. Areas are ways that people use to target, and you narrow down populations. So knowing areas, whatever they may be, are very important. Um, and we also use the copy command because um, just being able to load something into a table in Postgres is powerful in and of itself because you can have Postgres validate, oh yeah, this is, this column actually is an int, or it doesn't have an int, or it, or it has data in it that isn't necessarily the right type, or the type that they said it would be, um, or it's slightly malformed. Um, so you can eliminate things like that, but if there's a lot of really malformed data, you can use PG Loader to kick out uh, malformed rows. Uh, we go down to the address level most of the time with our geocoding. But, but I mean, are you, are you getting shape files from prefix? Yes. Uh, and then number two, how do you handle loader data where there's one piece of data that's obviously the wrong place? So as valid data, for example, 140-year-old loader. Um, for that, um, we need to actually ask, um, one, you have to ask the client what they wanted. Um, so you have to you have to do a, do a feedback cycle, which is where if I, we kick back things, um, 
you know, you, ha you have that, that row of bad data, we send it back to the client and go, what do you want us to do with this? Because. Um, the clients, um, the clients own their own data. We just provide a way for them to do import it and do analysis for it. But yeah, we we make sure that only they can see it and everything. But it's it's effectively their data because I I don't I don't have enough time to own their data. <laughs> We generally destroy the data when, in, when, a, when a relationship is terminated, okay. including all backups. And do you find uh, motor vaults or the other entity's data that you get from the client that hasn't been Oh, uh, van, voter vault, all of those are. Yes, I know, I'm just curious which, which of the two are the most leading. Neither one, actually. Okay. They're, they're about the same. They're, they're, they're all, they've all got their own quirks in different ways, so. Um, this is a really cut down example of something that I, we actually ran into with a client and their data. So like I'm going along and I'm loading this into Postgres and everything and then I do a, a group by and then I start finding things like this. And so you know like okay gender, male, female, G, well what, that, is that guy, is that girl, what does that mean? You know, it's like, well, okay, I could, if this is freeform, I could kind of see this, but like one and E, like so, so this thing. So we were able to load the data, and this was probably about nine million rows or so, and there was one percent of them that had this, these particular sorts of problems and everything. We were able to isolate them, export them, and kick them back to the client so they could actually do something with them. And um, in the end, we ended up just uh, nulling these. So they came up as unknown, um, which if we didn't have any client guidance, I would have probably suggested anyway, because it's fairly nonsensical. Um, but yes, Postgres helps us validate all these assumptions that customers have about their data. Um, you know, customers will provide a data dictionary and they'll say that a column is an int. That isn't always necessarily true. Um, and being able to push back things that are invalid also helps customers improve their data process. And really, really good data, having excellent data is absolutely key for doing good analysis, which is good targeting, which will make your canvassing better. This is all very important things. Um, again, shape files, they, um, you can import them with shape to PGSQL. It's really simple. It's like shape to PGSQL minus S 4269 and then point it at the shape file. You get some SQL, you load it. And you have a table, and then you can start doing everything that Postgres is really good at with it. Um, you can also use PostGIS for validating cleansing shapes and normalizing them. Um, because sometimes uh, shape files have slightly invalid geometries and areas and everything. You can clean all of that up with, you can just stack up functions and do that. Um, it even deals nicely with encoding issues, which is very nice. That's very, very nice. Um, so this is kind of an, this is an example of the um, the county shape file for Oregon from the U.S. Census, and the U.S. Census has really good data, but even though they have really good data, they have really inscrutable names for things. Um, like this is basically a central the, the central point of Lane County, um, which is where I'm from. Uh, and then you have this thing like the GOID, which consists of this little number 41 is the state FIPS code for Oregon, and 39 is the FIPS code for Lane County. Um, and a lot of our customers really don't care about little details like that. They really just want to see, like, okay, here's an area of Lane County, who's in it? Um, lots of them really aren't all that interesting. Like, they don't care about area land, area water, all that stuff. Um, and all of this basically needs to be shown to users in a format that they really understand. Um, so we make use of all of these different um, uh, post-GIS functions, and th these are the top ones. Um, ST is valid, is, is the geometry broken or not? Um, why is it not broken with ST is valid reason? 
Um, ST make valid is uses this uses an interesting set of algorithms to try and coerce it into a well-formed geometry. Um, sometimes that comes out in a multi a geometry collection format, which um, our engine doesn't understand. So we use ST multi to clean it up um, because it will force it into a, a multi geometry. Um, sometimes people want to like, okay, well, this is kind of bumpy and kind of weird and, and someone hand drew this, so can we expand it ever so slightly to make sure that we get everything? And you can do that with ST buffer and you can control that. Um, for exporting and making this pretty, we use um, STS text, which just prints it in, in this well-known text format, which is basically just longitude, latitude, and everything. Um, sometimes, though, like if you use ST centroid, because we, we try and print everything pretty and all of that, um, and we try and like center the name of it on the display over the centroid, and sometimes centroids aren't actually in the middle of something. so. You have to check to see if it contains, and if it does, then we find a, um, a point inside of the polygon, and then get its x and y coordinate and use that. Um, we also do intersections, because sometimes people will have polygons, and they'll be like, well, you know, these really should have been together. So um, we take it, and we use ST intersect, and we glom it together, and then export that as uh, a shapefile, and we use these to make things that we call uh, mesh. Um, but we normalize fields and we normalize the containing data because sometimes it isn't always in a pretty format. Sometimes it isn't like Lane County. Sometimes it's just like uh, 39 and then we have to go make a lookup table and then instead of 39 we print Lane County. Um, this, this Stuff like this was especially bad when um, all of the states were going through their redistricting and they would just publish shape files with basically a sequence and then numbers saying like, okay, this is, this is district one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a geometry, and you had to know from, you had to know the context of all of it from where you downloaded it and what it was, and you know, you needed to know that you needed to put it down congressional district one, two, three, four, and all of that. Um, but we do this so people don't have to be GIS experts, so that they can just do their own thing. Um, and that lets them you know, focus on what they, what they really want to do, which is isolate, display people in areas important to them, and then narrow them down for targeting. Um, so this is an example of a mesh. There's like Lane County here, and you can see where everything's all centered. Like there's uh, Harney County and Lake County and Klamath and everything. Um, and we have all sorts of different, other different areas here um, that you can choose from. Uh, and you can do all sorts of mixing and matching of the data. Um, so the whole layout and presentation of this thing is very important here. Um, it really needs to be easy to customize and everything because some people need some features, some people need others, some people legally aren't allowed to have some features or they aren't allowed to show some data and some people need to see this data and you need to keep everything straight. Um, so we needed something that was very easy to customize and work in. Um, originally, when I came along, these were defined in flat files with this on-disk JSON. Um, and our web developers did that because they do Node.js and they adore JSON um, because it's really, really easy to work with JSON there. Um, so I took it and did some manipulating with it and then decided on using Ltree. Um, to take JSON and store it in tables. Um, it makes ad hoc queries really, really, really simple. Um, we started out in 8.3, we moved to 8.4. Um, I showed some of the devs recursive queries and they went kind of like, uh, uh. So I was like, okay, well, what's the sort of query format that you would actually wanna deal with? And so I went through a couple of things and we came up, with, we looked at Ltree and we used that. Um, it makes, what? It works really well, actually. Oh, it's totally fast. It's, um, we, we can get trees with uh, 22,000 entities out in the cloud about um, somewhere, anywhere between 100 and 
100 milliseconds to like really fast if it's in cache to like, you know, 16 milliseconds, or not milliseconds, yeah. Yeah, yeah 100 or 16 milliseconds, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, this makes ad hoc queries really simple. It's very quick to read, it's, it's very quick to pull data out. Um, and, it's quick, and it's easy to update in place, um, and it's also easy to append things to it if you want to. Um, so this is one of those things that we do. We, we, we call like how an application is laid out application attributes. Um, and this is for labels and lists Oregon, and I chose this smaller path so it would actually show up on the slide next. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of our developers just wanted to deal with this. Oh yeah, you can do a regular expression-ish thing on here on path um, and isolate stuff. Um, and you can just, like, if we need to change, like, uh, Bing Maps license or something, or the license, the API key, it's just a, a single update like that. And it's actually, it actually works really nice in a lot of ways. So, and this is kind of what the table looks like. And here's the, the map part. So, like, just for dealing with the map, there's the adapter, which is two, which is Bing Maps. You can switch this in and out if you want with an update. Um, this is basically centers the map on top of Oregon, puts it in a particular type, because the map can have like auto or whatever. You can, you can have very, very fine-grained control of what's there. And you can enable features like polygons and sampling and universes and things like that. And um, you can preserve like the tree order here of JSON, which is actually really nice. Um, so you can, you can make sure things are nested, like here's counties and underneath counties, um, nested underneath are just the like county commissioner districts and everything. So um, you can, people can click through and narrow down to the, the small areas that they're actually interested in very easily. And we, we try and keep this as simple as possible. But there are downsides to everything because um, it's a lot of work to coerce it into the format. You, have, you parse the JSON and then you kind of turn it into, um, you turn it into a row. And um, there's, there's a trigger to update the, the L tree path and do, do other things and keep track of stuff. There's, there's a lot of mechanisms for that. And because of that, it takes up extra storage space because there's extra indexes and triggers and all sorts of things like that. But all in all, it works pretty well. Um, now, once we have the data, once we have the data in, we clean the data in Postgres, and we've defined with Ltree how um, how the interface works. How do actually how do people actually use this? What how do they accomplish real work with it? So here's kind of an example that I went through of this. I took our Polygon tool, and I decided I didn't I wasn't interested in any area that we had predefined, so I made my own of this neighborhood in Eugene. Um, and so I just, I just clicked and drew it out. And people do this all the time in our system. Uh, one user has um, patiently drawn out about 400 of these. Um, and so you can you narrow down a selection of this to you know, this particular neighborhood. Um, and everything. And it, it's really hard to predict what people want to do. Like, when we originally envisioned polygons, we never expected that someone would sit there and patiently draw out like 400 of them. Uh, so flexible data formats like JSON are really, really, really helpful because we have no clue what people are gonna do with some things. And we just can't predict enough of that stuff. And we use JSON in a few places um, but one of, the, one of the really, really good ones is for random user state. It makes it easy for devs because they're used to dealing with JSON and everything, and all they have to do is update a field and everything. Um, and it's easy for me because I'm not always making database patches and running alter table, alter table, add column, alter table, add column. Uh, so yes, relational and semi-structured is really amazing. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. Um, <laughs> So um, originally when we came up with this table, and this is just part of it because the, the values with JSON are really, um, uh, they're really long and they're really big. Um, 
off on the side here, off on the left, you know, you'll have, you'll have uh, the relational things that you need, like their username and the app name and the customer name, everything that we use to keep isolated. And we have like time, <coughs> timestamps and what data this applies to and some, some other things. But we have all of this relational stuff that keeps track of all of this. And then we store the stuff that we have no clue what they're going to do with in JSON. Like um, here is my, my dog survey polygon. And it's got the name. And then it's got the coordinates here and everything. Um, also, I had um, a couple of meshes set um, and some of my color buys and stuff like that. So like this. All of this shows, like, OK, I had this thing set at one time, so, um, and I, I made custom colors for things. So um, it'll keep track of all of that. And we have no idea what selectors people are going to use and what colors they're going to want and everything. And, but people definitely want to save all of this stuff, and they want to come back to their uh, analytic state when they're done. You know, they'll, they'll go away, they'll come back, they want to not lose this stuff. So we store it like this, and it works really, really well. Um, this, worked, this worked pretty well um, in 8.4. We, we did this actually just with text fields, um, just because it was so handy. Um, but, you know, with just having it being text, um, there's problems with invalid data. If there's a bug in the app, it'll write invalid JSON, so, which sometimes causes problems like when you, write, when you write invalid JSON and then the app comes back and it tries to read the invalid JSON, there's times it will crash, and that is really sad. Um, so that's one of the problems we had because it's just text. Also, trying to manipulate anything with, Anything inside that JSON inside of the database was really, really obnoxious. Like I tried writing um, PLv8 functions and uh, PL Perl functions, and it just turned really gruesome. Um, but um, uh, another way that people also save their state is they make this thing called a universe. So I took that polygon selection, and then I saved it. Um, in what we call a universe, which is really just a grouping of people. Um, and so, yes, like I said, uh, a universe is a safe set of people. Um, it's based on that static data, that NFS stuff. And it's created in the, the geospatial engine we have. Um, but it's saved in Postgres. Um, and it's done that way for some really important reasons that I will get to. But this is kind of what it looks like. So you have, you have that non, non the, the relational data here um, that keeps track of everything. You have your name and your app name and your data source and your customer and all this other stuff. And then you have a whole, just a whole ton of bytes um, in different, different ways and places and everything. And that's basically just frozen application state. Um, so, like, when it saves that, um, and the, those query servers go up and down, they dynamically scale with our load. So, you're not guaranteed to, even, to be on the same system that you were on, like, you know, 30 minutes ago, because the application will unload. Um, and then it'll just slurp this state back up, and you can start, just start working. Um, it lets us keep track of lots of data in a really small place. Um, it actually comes out due to like the compression and stuff um, to 109 bytes total for 600 people, just making it really, really, really small. Um, that's the byte area, and then you have just have the the additional row data to describe all of this. Um, and we use universes to define assignments for canvassing. Um, in our in the version one system that we had for this before I came along, these were saved directly on the file system, and I had just the tail end of experience of this, and that was kind of enough for me. Um, there were lots of problems, especially if the app crashed, and sometimes it would crash in the middle of writing or doing something, and that would corrupt the little binary files that these universes were saved in. Um, and we had a cron job that backed them up like every 10 minutes, um, because that was basically how it was handled before I came along. Um, 
and we would have to restore them, like because customers would call up and be like, I uh, can't load my app, or um, all of my all of my walking lists disappeared. Um, you know, terrible, terrible things like that. Um, so yeah, restoring them sucked. Um, and they also had these really opaque names because um, it was really easy for the programmer just to write them out that way. Um, but Postgres centralizes all of this because we have the servers that go up and down and up and down. We can't even we can't guarantee that those files will still be there if they were written down to the file system and writing to NFS <laughs> will take forever. Um, so Postgres centralizes this all in one place, keeps all the data together. We don't have to worry about corrupt files or anything like that because it either makes it into Postgres or it doesn't. If it crashes, someone has to redo their thing, but that's way better than them having to wait um, 30 to 45 minutes while I make sure that I got all the right files and I untarred them and everything's good. Um, all in all, this really, really has saved us a lot of customer time because they're not waiting. They're going like, hey, Lacey, when are you going to fix this? And then developer time because I'll be like, this crashed. We really need to fix this. And sysadmin time where I'm like, oh, tar, which file? OK. Um, so Postgres does, this is, this is really amazing. Um, Postgres just lets us do this. And we can get on to doing other things. Um, so, when you take a universe, which is just a group of people, and a survey, which is just a group of questions, and you mash them together, you can do canvassing. Um, you can create a survey in the user interface, and it's basically just stored as JSON because, you know, you just keep an order of the questions and you let people, you know, manipulate them and reorder them and do other things. Um, and this is kind of what the interface looks like. Um, so you can make a survey, and you can choose whether or not you want multiple choice stuff. You can, cho you can change your leader name question. All of, this, all of these things. Um, and once you make that, it's stored um, with associating data in Postgres along with some metadata about it, too. Um, and then you take and you assign it to a universe, which here is referred to as a walking list. They're also, terminology needs a little clarification, I think, probably in our organization. Um, and then you can assign it to a particular user. So once all that's finished, you are totally ready for canvassing. And you go and you get the, um, an iOS or Android app, and, um, then log in and start downloading stuff onto the device. And this is what, what it looks like. And so you can have multiple campaigns. We keep all these straight for them. Um, all of this data is downloaded onto SQLite on the, on the app. Um, you can tell when you're going to sync. You can do other things like that. This is my little Joe Canvasser um, and a screenshot off my phone. Um, so. You know, once you get that, you get like these walking list details. So this is my, this is my walking list, and then I'll have like questions. But this lists out like every address because uh, that universe um, gets turned into a CSV and then downloaded and parsed, and it gets associated with that JSON because that's all parsed also on the iOS app, and then put into the little SQLite database. So that you don't really actually need a network connection while you're doing a bunch of stuff, but it really helps when you, you, know, you want to send it back to the mothership. Um, so this is basically just a neighborhood in Eugene. Um, and this happened to be the closest address when I had the idea to do this when I was out shopping at Safeway. Um, so um, and this is basically the interface here that you can look at. Um, so there's your leader question. And then you can just pick things here, um, whichever is in your, your multi-choice. Um, and then you can have freeform text, but that's really hard to display for people. Um, so we, we, we let people export it, but we don't show it on any sort of interface. And um, email address is also hard to show, and there, there are some weird rules about them, so we just don't show them. I also totally uh, scribbled out the, the name of the person that I was the person of the house I was in front of. Um, so 
Within that app, you can either choose to sync things back purposefully or in the background. Um, and when you do that, it goes through the API server, then goes into the query server, and then it's turned into another sort of frozen application state that's stored very similarly, but separately, um, in a byte A just like uh, universes. And this is really, really powerful because it allows this whole full circle of analysis. Um, so yeah, I you know parked over here, just pushed on some some buttons in my car and everything on my phone, um, and randomly answered some questions. Um, and you can see like some of them like cats and dogs, some of them like neither, um, just because I randomly chose that way. Um, and my little Joe Canvasser canvassed six people. You can also see that I missed a few people here because they're still gray, which is the uncanvassed color. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you get feedback here based on like your answers and everything about like what about your survey is popular or unpopular, and you can use that to see who who within within a group is likely to support you, who isn't. Um, you can try out different questions and see like the results of that because people do that. People will canvas the same people over with a different set of questions just because. Human psychology is weird, and if you phrase something slightly different, um, some people are more likely to go one way or another. Um, but um, this basically lets you do that whole full circle of analysis that I was talking about, and that's really powerful because you just get to iterate and iterate and iterate and um, try and get the best result for whatever you're trying to accomplish with your mobile canvassing. So. Postgres is also very com convenient as well. It has all sorts of things. Um, it has these flexible types and everything and flexible ways that you can model your data and everything. And it's really kind of a platform unto itself, actually, because there's just like, there's an ecosystem around it, there's contrib, there's everything. Um, and it's, um, contrib is especially full of goodies like PG Crypto. Um, and it lets you use, um, you can also, you, in Postgres you can make user-defined types, um, and you can mix them with functions and things like that, and one of the things that I used was um, I made a password type and a couple of comparison functions um, to, do, to do password hashing, because it had been done really inefficiently in the web app before, and it was inspired by the check pass contra module. Um, which was actually really cool, but didn't quite do what I want. Um, there's a little trigger that basically just hashes the password as it comes in. A password is equal to something or not equal. The, the hash is equal or not equal. There's really nothing else. Um, uh, we use it to like authenticate people and everything. Um, and it offloads a lot of work from the developers because they, the original web app had um, a really weird way of doing it um, that was lots of lines of code, and it was basically just an MD5 and a number, and that, didn't, that wasn't really all that good as far as security. But even for this, there are security considerations, though, um, that I got pointed out to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> that um, the... Postgres process can see that and um, can see the plain text and everything. So if, so if someone's able to get like and look in your logs or they're able to compromise the Postgres process in some way, they can see people's passwords and do things like that. And that is definitely something that you would want to consider um, with doing something like that. Um, we are totally, totally screwed if someone gets on our database. Um, so um, we... Um, we protect it really, really well, so this actually works fairly well for us anyway. Um, another awesome, convenient thing actually is Pitter. Um, everybody knows Pitter's good for high availability and disaster recovery and everything, but it involves these extra servers just kind of like waiting there and doing their thing and whatever. Um, and that, always, that doesn't always look good to management. <laughs> 
um, especially like if you're in a startup and uh, cost is an issue, and it's like, so what are these servers doing? Like, well, they're there in case something goes really, really wrong, but do, I mean, is something really gonna go wrong or can we not have this? So you have all these questions. Um, and one of the things that um, I do with the, the slaves is I take snapshots of them and I use this tool called Omnipitter because it's, it's really, really handy. Um, it's amazing. Thank you, OmniTI. Um, so I have three warm standbys from our one production data center. I have one that's delayed um, just because you know, sometimes people can, can do something weird or sometimes an app can have a bug and if it mangles data or drops it or whatever, um, I can play right up to that moment and then stop and have a database that's lost possibly a little bit of data but isn't nearly as horribly mangled as, as it could have been. And then we have our, our staging in East and our testing in, in a West Coast data center um, out in the cloud. And this lets me keep those in sync actually really well. Um, and um, just scripting this and doing a weekly snapshot lets us keep staging up to date so that when we know when we're rolling out code that, okay, this is, this is a, a, as close to recent production snapshot as we can possibly do. And um, we know that, okay, this isn't really going to do anything too terrible or anything um, with everything. Um, I, Omnipitter has a, a bunch of functions for this and stuff um, that lets you just take a snapshot off a slave. Um, but I've uh, used scripts. I've wrapped it so that people who aren't me can do this. Um, because, you know, sometimes... I want to sit at home and have scotch and watch My Little Pony. Um, <laughs> so um, they can do this stuff. Uh, they, they take the, the backup. Uh, they untar it um, wherever they need to, even for their developer systems. And off, off you run and off you go. Um, it takes about like an hour and 20 minutes from soup to nuts. Um, and for me, at least with the startup and the, the considerations of all of this stuff, it's a much easier sell, sell to say, this keeps us safe from disasters, but it also let the developers find bugs that they wouldn't have otherwise found. Um, because they can have a snapshot of production, and they can have their code on test, and they can see the differences and go like, well, okay, this is, the data is pretty much the same here. So this weird UI thing or this weird thing where counts are off, this is probably because of a code bug, not because of something we saved or, or because the data itself is off. You can do this lovely A-B side-by-side -side comparison and it's really handy. Um, it also means that my developers are testing my backups, um, which, you know, offloading some work onto them is always nice, plus it makes them happy. Um, so PostgreSQL and its ecosystem of tools are this really key part of our infrastructure. We use it for a lot of different things. We use it to keep things, um, we use it to keep things running. We use it to offload really hard work because it does things like durability really well. Um, and it does a bunch of other stuff for us. We really wouldn't have as nice a system without it. So does anybody have questions about stuff? Uh, yes? What do you use for picking the route for the failure zone? Fixing the traveling salesman problem? The traveling salesman problem? Um, they want to... Um, generally, people have a planned route that they want to follow. So we have an interface that lets them draw it out in whatever way they want because even if we algorithmically try to plan it, which is kind of an interesting and semi-cool problem, but also a very hard problem, um, we're not gonna make people happy enough for them to wanna use it. So um, we just, we let them draw it out because that's what they wanna do. Exactly, exactly so. Right. Yeah, so we don't, we don't want to do that. We, we, we tried it out, and yeah, it ended up like that. People didn't like it. So the problem for basically, as you mentioned earlier, 
Yeah. Uh, no, that's basically um, there's there's phone numbers and stuff in the data or, or in the customer data, and we just we just display it in a slightly different interface. Um, so um, yeah, we, we basically it basically lets people do what they can do on the on the mobile device with multiple phone numbers in a web app is really all that's for, and they find that really handy actually. Um, okay, uh, are there any other questions about stuff? Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, and if you want to get, get a look at any of the free stuff that we have, you can look here. Um, and I can give people the link for that, but we have stuff that's available to the public just to look at. and see what the system's like. So thank you all.